Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. When Mormon pioneers came to southern Idaho and northern Utah, they ate a lot of the deer and buffalo that Native Americans depended on for survival. It definitely changed Native American life, especially among the Shoshone tribes that were in that area. In our next conversation with Darren Perry, author of the Bear River Massacre, we'll talk about how Native American life changed. For one thing, Native Americans ignored fences that Mormons built around their cattle and found those as to be a source of food, which definitely created tensions among the Indians and the Mormons. We'll talk more about that in our next conversation. And oh, by the way, if you want to see the whole video, sign up for just $8 a month, either to gospeltangents.com, click on the yellow subscribe button, or patreon.com slash gospeltangents, or you can go to youtube.com slash gospeltangents and see the entire interview. So you've got three ways to see that. Just make sure that I'm Facebook friends with you, and I'll add you to the group for just $8 a month, and you can see the entire interview. Now back to our conversation. So, okay, so the Shoshone were here for generations before 1847, <laughs> when yeah. Brigham Young came. Yeah. Um, and it seems like they were fairly friendly with, with the Mormon pioneers. At they, the time. they were. In fact, Sagwich and his band were here in the Cache Valley. There were quite a few different groups in the Cache Valley. Bear Hunter and his group was here. He was a Northwestern. Uh, Pocatello. Chief Pocatello was here, uh, in and out of the area, spent most of his time uh, over by the City of Rocks and the Raft River Mountains and very northeastern, northwestern Utah, over past Snowville. So he, he was hanging out in that area. So, uh, yeah, they were here for a long, long time, and uh, that all changed. They wintered here. In fact, all the groups would come together in the winter months at the massacre site uh, because of the hot springs. And so Sagwich was probably over a group of 100, but Pocatello had 100, Bear Hunter had 100, Chief Sandpitch was a Northwestern, he had that many. So these groups would all come together. Uh, they all used Cache Valley as their home, but they would come together to winter. But I, I know Sagwich was here when Peter Mon got here. They were the first settlers sent by Brigham Young. Funny thing is, Peter Monin comes in 1855. In 1854, Peter Monin is in Tooele and having the crickets and grasshoppers eat everything they ever planted. <laughs> uh, he writes a letter to Brigham Young and says, this is a crap hole. We don't want to be here anymore. Where else can we go? And he ends up sending them, uh, they just discovered the Cache Valley. And so he sends Peter Mon and a bad group of about 20 up here. We know they got along, though, because Peter Mon, we have letters from Peter Mon to Brigham Young saying that Sagwich and his band are the friendly ones. Always referred to Sagwich as the friendly one. So friendly that there's a couple of mountain peaks and a basin up here named after Sagwich by the pioneers. Hmm. So we know they had a good relationship. Uh, we know that Sagwich helped the pioneers that first came to the valley. They Those first pioneers came to the valley in late September to establish a community. Well, late September in Cache Valley, it's getting cold. And winter comes a little bit earlier here than anywhere else. And so... But he showed the pioneers what plants they could eat, where the roots were, and how they could really live, help them build lodges. Uh, some of the lodges, those early pioneer lodges, were helped built by the, the Shoshone people too. So, But we know that, and so Peter Mon always referred to Sagwich as a friendly one, which tells me there were other groups up here that weren't near as friendly. Pocatello's band, and especially Bear Hunter's band, were really adversarial to the pioneers. They'd steal things as often as they could. Uh, they didn't want their presence here at all. I think Sagwich had a little more inclusive uh, demeanor. I think he probably knew it was inevitable, and it was better to try to get along than to, to fight it. So, But he was very good with the early pioneers, and so, uh, yeah. 
Hmm, interesting. Okay, so let's let's jump into so just just for frame of reference, um, September eleventh, eighteen fifty seven was the Mountain Meadows massacre, okay. and so we've got a lot of violence going on here, and of course that's in southern Utah. Um, the Civil War begins in eighteen sixty one, basically, sure. and um, so tell us when the uh, Bear River massacre occurred. The massacre happened in on January 29th in 1863. So up at, you know, all those years from Peter Mott getting here in 55, those eight years saw thousands of pioneers come to the valley. It saw the, the pioneers relocate all of their cattle herd to the Cache Valley. They, I think they had more than 4,000 head of cattle here at one point in those early years. And because of the grass and the water, there was so much natural feed for the for the animals that they were brought here. Well, that put a a damper on a hunting gathering lifestyle. You needed wild seeds and grasses. You needed the fish that were in the streams, and you needed the deer and elk and buffalo that may have been here. The and I'm speaking about the bison now, but there were deer and elk and other things that were here that the Shoshones had lived on and had no problems ever finding a food source because it was such a rich environment. But now you have thousands of pioneers that are looking for the same uh, food source. And, and the difference is the pioneers had an agricultural lifestyle. They knew how to plant crops. They knew how to do that. The Shoshones had no idea how to plant crops. They only knew how to hunt and gather. And so with the depletion of those resources, really what really was the big cause of the massacre. That, and now you introduce gold in California and Oregon. Uh, people from back east coming, the California, Oregon trails, cut through the very heart of the Shoshone land. And so now you're starting to have depredations and a few other things, but that's really uh, the environment towards the Civil War, uh, towards, you know, 1863. I think the pioneers that were living here, and look, it, Brigham Young always had the, the mantra, it's easier to feed the Indians than to fight them. He said that many times from the pulpit. Uh, but he lived in the confines of Salt Lake. I mean, there, there weren't any bad things going to happen to him and his family in Salt Lake. But you take a family out here that's out in the middle of Menden, perhaps, and there's not another pioneer family within a mile, and you have a cow or two, and you're trying to make it as a small family, and and now the the natives are taking your cattle or stealing or begging for food at your doorstep. Uh, that's a different thing. So to ask them, it's easier to feed them than to fight them. For the most part, they had a hard time feeding themselves and their families. So, you know, it's not lost on me that uh, why the saints that were here had a problem with the natives. They they were out in the middle of nowhere, and they had a hard time living themselves. So I'll cut them a little bit of slack because, of, you know, I, I'd want to take care of my family too. And I just don't think they had enough to take care of everybody. But uh, that starts generating letters from saints here in the Cache Valley that end up to Salt Lake and then end up to a federal judge that, look, the Indians are causing problems. We're having a hard time feeding our own families. We can't feed them anymore. You got to come take care of the Indian problem. And so uh, what were letters to probably Brigham Young ended up somehow to a federal judge in Salt Lake who, uh, at the end of the day, issued arrest warrants for the chiefs, Bear Hunter, Sagwich, uh, Sand Pitch, and Pocatello. And so, but who's going to serve an arrest warrant? You know, there was nobody back in the day. The only people that were here in the Cache Valley were the, the church leaders. They were usually the civic leaders, too. Peter Mon, Henry Ballard. Uh, not the Henry Ballard, his great-great-grandfather, Henry Ballard. And so these guys are here in charge, and 
you know, they're not serving any warrants. So uh, that task went to Colonel Patrick Connor, who was ironically stationed just up the road at Camp Douglas at the University of Utah today. But uh, And they were there. <laughs> they shouldn't have been there. Uh, Patrick Connor and his California volunteers sign up to go fight in the Civil War in 1861 in California. That's what they thought they were going to do. They all signed ragtag group. They all had different rifles. I mean, but they wanted to go fight in the Civil War. And so they leave California halfway across Nevada. They get new orders. And the new orders were, we're having a hard time protecting the overland mail route. You got to establish a fort in Salt Lake to protect that. But not only that, you need to keep an eye on the Mormons. Uh, the Mormons, we think, are going to succeed from the Union. So this is coming from the United States government. So this is from Lincoln. Yeah. Lincoln says the Mormons moved to Mexico. They were worried that they might form an alliance. The Mormons might form an alliance with the Mexican people or the Native American people. But, you know... They were not in the United States. It wasn't the United States then. And and they said, you're going to establish this camp in Salt Lake to keep an eye on babysit the Mormons, basically. And Connor and his men reluctantly, I mean, what do you do? You, you, you go where you're told to go. And so they established a camp, Camp Douglas, up on the hill. They were told to aim their cannons out over the valley to downtown Salt Lake to just intimidate and, and look the Mormons weren't causing trouble so I'm sure it was a easy job but they were bored and and they'd signed up to kill people and fight and now they're babysitting the least violent group of people in the world well you know as, as well, you Mount look Mount at Mount 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 they might not say yeah. they were least yeah. violent yeah. so I shouldn't have said that so <laughs> some groups anyway but as a collective, the, they weren't that violent of a group. And so uh, the fact that they're stuck there now watching babysitting was not what they'd signed up to do. Mm -hmm. So now they hear about Indian troubles 80 miles away. And it's in their jurisdiction. It's in an area where they can get to quickly. And so... Um, and this was part of Utah. It's now part of Idaho. Yeah. But at the it time, was, it was part yeah, of... Yeah, Utah territories. Yeah. And so... Uh, it was absolutely something that they were willing to do. But Connor, he even said before he left Salt Lake, I, I have no intentions of going up there to arrest anyone. Uh, I'm not serving arrest warrants. I'm not going to deprive my men a little fun of Indian killing. Mm. But that's kind of how the government, the federal government, looked at things. I mean, there was a point there where Indians had bounties on their heads. You could actually get paid to, to turn in an Indian scalp. And, and so uh, they were looked at differently. And so they uh, absolutely wanted to go take care of the Indian problem. You know, the problem for that, the saints here were, were the ones sending the letters saying, come take care of the Indian problem. I, and I'm going to cut them a little slack here. And, and I don't know, I take some heat uh, from friends and colleagues about this, because I, I want to give the pioneers that were here the benefit of the doubt. I don't think they had in mind a wholesale massacre of those people, because in a lot of respects, they were sandwiching as people who had a wonderful relationship with most of them. So I, I don't want to say they want, they thought the army was going to come up here and massacre 450 Shoshone men, women, and children. I think the government in those early years were moving tribes. Uh, the Trail of Tears and other uh, tribes were being relocated from one area to, you know, Oklahoma, the Indian territories. And so I just want to believe in my heart of hearts that the saints probably had that in mind. Could you come up here and take care of the problem? But from our perspective, it might be moving the Shoshone somewhere else, at least out of our backyard. We don't want them here anymore. So we were just so the idea you think was the Mormons just wanted to move them away so they would quit. Yeah, them. gone. Get, you've been doing this as a federal government 
all across the country, and especially back east, all of those eastern tribes were moved to Oklahoma. And so I, I want to believe that's what they wanted, just the problem to go away. I don't think they envisioned a wholesale massacre. And, and I don't know, maybe that's the LDS side of me giving them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, but when you see the Mountain Meadows massacre and you see other things that transpired and, and some of the atrocities that even LDS people can do in the name of religion and the name of manifest destiny. I mean, when you feel like you have a God-given right to be here, uh, you can pretty much do whatever you want to make sure that that's achieved. So, but I don't know. I, I just feel like, and, and I guess I take uh, consolation from some of the comments from some of the local saints after the massacre were horrified by what they saw. But while, while some were horrified, some of the leadership, including Henry Ballard that was here, said the, the massacre was an intervention from our Heavenly Father. And the Shoshones were punished without them having to do it. And so, without the Mormons, without having, to the Mormons having to do it. And so you get mixed messages from the locals, uh, most of them horrified, but the leadership saying, well, we tried to show them, we tried to teach them. Peter Mon, in a letter uh, dated February 4th, 1863, to, to Brigham Young, said, uh, we have tried and tried to teach them our ways, and they've perished relying upon their own strength and wisdom. And so that's the mm -hmm. verbiage that goes to Brigham Young, and, and somehow letting them off the hook. And so... While I'm sure some of the saints were, were horrified by it, there were other leadership position people that were saying this was an act of the Almighty God. And so that's a little more troublesome for me. But uh, I, I tend to not want to judge people that lived 157 years ago on the, the morale that I have in my own heart today. We know so much more 157 years later, so I don't think it's really fair or accurate to judge people based on the values that they had then. Uh, it was the Wild West. A lot of things took place in the Wild West that we would never uh, sign off on today. But, you know, it is what it is at the end of the day. Uh, those things happened. Uh, the saints were responsible. They didn't fire a bullet, but they were absolutely responsible by them being here. Uh, the depletion of resources. And so, uh, yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a sad tale in the history of our state. And, and me saying that and writing the book and talking about those hard issues, it's okay because that's, at the end of the day, that's not the message. The message to me is always about a group of people that went through a horrific experience, ended up joining the church, ended up being faithful. In fact, the missionary that converted them, George Washington Hill, said they exhibited a, a childlike faith that he'd never seen before. They were full tithe payers. They helped build the Logan <clears throat> Temple. And so uh, they were just faithful. And he compared them to the people of Ammon in the Book of Mormon. And and so that that's just who I'm a product of. I, you know, that, those early years, those first Sagwich and his people used to perform the the sun dance, which is a really a radical uh, ceremony that a lot of tribes still perform today. And we don't do that anymore. But those early uh, Shoshone Latter Day Saints did. And the funny thing is the church allowed them to still practice some of that old religion. And just over generations, it slowly, you know, crept out because of, you know, once you got start getting, well, I was born in the church and this is what they're teaching me. Those other ways, uh, not always for the good, tend to disappear. I wish we still performed ceremonies like that. And in fact, I still participate and on January 2nd, I've been invited by the Eastern Band at Wind River to go up and perform the war bonnet dance. So here's Sagwitch's headdress. 
Uh, That's the actual yeah, headdress? Yes. Oh, you're kidding. I didn't no. realize that. So, now, it's been repaired a few times, but those are the feathers. So, you know, I wonder if if he was wearing that during the massacre. I, the stories they could tell. But on the January 2nd, I get to go up to the, the Eastern Band and participate in the War Bonnet Dance. The War Bonnet Dance is performed once a year, at the first Saturday in January. And it's the only time that a, a woman can wear a, the war bonnet. Hmm. It's the only time they're allowed. And so the, the, the ceremony is the men dance a couple of songs, and then they put a war bonnet on a woman that's across from them. And then the woman dances one song, and then they dance a song together. But the woman is given the war bonnet dance to signify uh, their contribution in protecting the village when the men were away on hunting trips because they were in charge. They were, if something happened, they they dealt with it. And so that's the only time a, a woman can actually wear the war bonnet. Hmm. So I've never done it before, and, and I'm really excited to go up and participate again. Wow. Because I think some of those things are just really important that we keep alive. Definitely. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Darren Perry, author of The Bear River Massacre. In our next conversation, we're going to visit the first of three memorial sites in southern Idaho and see the first monument that was dedicated to what was known at the time as the Bear River Battle. This rock collecting campaign started. Some of these rocks are from Nauvoo temple site wow really? there's there's rocks from all over from when the pioneers came west and so these rocks had a significant historical uh, reference to the family that submitted them and so from that this monument was developed and the first plaque that you're looking at today right now was erected in 1932 thanks for listening if you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut sign up at patreon.com slash gospel tangents and for five dollars a month you can hear the entire interview without any interruptions if you'd like to see the whole video that's just eight dollars a month and you can sign up either at youtube.com slash gospel tangents or on our website at gospeltangents.com and click the yellow subscribe button or you can go to patreon.com slash gospel tangents and i'll just need to make sure that we're facebook friends and i'll add you to our insiders group and you can see the entire interview uncut if you'd like to get pdf transcripts of our interviews those are just ten dollars a month and for just fifteen dollars a month i will send you paperback versions of our transcripts um, as soon as they come out or of course you can uh, buy them on amazon as well uh, go to Amazon.com and do a search for Gospel Tangents Interview, and uh, you can see all of our transcripts there. Don't forget to sign up for our updates at Facebook.com slash Gospel Tangents. Of course, you can follow us at Gospel Tangents on Twitter. To hear our interviews updated to your podcast player, go to tinyurl.com slash Gospel Tangents, and make sure you give us a five-star review. And of course, you should show your support for Gospel Tangents with one of these cool t-shirts like this green one, or light blue, sport gray, royal blue, purple, of course, black, beautiful gold, and of course, Utah red. I've probably left out some colors, but if you want to see more, go to gospeltangents.com shop and you can uh, get one of these. So once again, thanks for listening. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again.